Let's go ahead and open in prayer, and we will begin. Lord, we, we want and we have a desire to know you better. It's the only way we can do that. It's not through our imaginations, not through our, our uh, mysticism and our, and our approach to the world, or, but it's through your word. Your word is the information we need to understand you better. It is the information we need to be able to have a proper communication with you, for that is the only way you communicate to us. We cannot rely upon our heart. We cannot rely upon our minds. We cannot rely upon other people. It is your word. Help us to communicate it properly, to study it well, to understand it, so that we would be able to, to function in an appropriate manner as a body of believers, explain your text uh, as, as we should, uh, to be that light to the place in darkness, and above all, to give you glory, because you are the God of creation, the God of our salvation. You preserve us, and you're coming again for us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Welcome back, world traveler. <laughs> I, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 and I got, again, if I could, it, it, even if you're at home, like laying down, so you know, I need, really need to get to sleep, and I, I'm used for that purpose. I, you know what? That's, I, at least I'm useful. You know what I'm saying? That's fine. We are in the studies of Matthew. We are dealing with the kingdom of heaven. Whenever you're in Matthew, you got to remind yourself the kingdom of heaven. And hopefully that reminds you that it's not about you. It is about Israel. It's about the actual physical kingdom and the restoration of Israel. We're dealing with the portion of scripture that deals with the sign at the end of the age. Specifically, we're dealing with the Olivet Discourse. We're in part 16. I can't believe I've done 16 lessons and I'm not done yet. Part 16, the parables of the Olivet Discourse. This is uh, uh, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the parable of the 10 virgins. I always kind of like blush when I say that, you know, like, you know, isn't that strange? Virgins is outside of our vocabulary, typically, unless we're talking very technical. You know, we just don't call around talking about virgins, unless you're on an airplane. Did you take Virgin Atlantic? No, did you take well, what? Did you, what, what airline did you take? Delta. Delta? Oh, that's boring. <laughs> yeah. <all right. laughs> so remember, in this section, in this section, Matthew twenty-four and twenty-five, it deals with the. In this section, particularly, we're dealing with parables. Now, it's after the section of the text in which Jesus already discussed the signs of his coming. So. These parables discuss the when, but more specifically, what they should be doing prior to the when. Now, the when is, you don't know. He goes, even I don't know. We don't know when it's going to happen, so therefore, we always have to be ready. In the parables, we have the parable of the fig tree, parable of the ten birds, and parable of the talents. Now, those three parables fit the entire full mold of a parable. There are also three analogies, days of Noah, like a thief, and faithful and evil slave, which are contained in Matthew 24. Those sections um, kind of like have some characteristics of a parable, although since the Bible doesn't either call them a parable or have all the characteristics of a parable, I simply just call them analogies. As I've stated before, those individuals who want to call them parables, I'm not going to argue with. Um, I just want to make sure we understand the distinction and why we do make that distinction. All of these parables, all of these analogies, all point to one thing. Always be ready. Now, we're reading this from the perspective of not ourselves, not our church, and not our time right now dealing with our actual administration. Rather, we're reading it from their perspective, from their eschatology, not from ours. Now, to do a little review, just to make sure we're all on the same page, in Matthew 24, 45 through 51, it is the previous analogy. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds doing so when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave uh, says in his heart, my master is not yet coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him into pieces 
and assign him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, in that particular analogy, it deals with the leadership of Israel. I'm emphasizing this because the next two parables, I believe, do not. I believe the next two parables deal with the overall main population. But this one here is aimed directly at those slaves who are put in charge of other slaves. It doesn't deal with all the slaves. And the when it deals with that, um, the, the leadership that is responsible, it is a comparison and a contrast to those who are in the leadership at that time. Remember, Jesus Christ called all the Pharisees hypocrites. They are hypocrites. They are ones that that are will be assigned in that location as well. They also are not, are not leading people into the kingdom. So these unfaithful, these evil slaves that will be at the time of the final generation of the remnant will be assigned to the, to the exact same position as those Pharisees of the current time. However, there, unlike there was at that time, during the time of the the, the of Jacob's trouble, the last remnant of Israel, there will be some leadership who will be good. And those leadership will be greatly blessed because they're the ones that are kind of like in leadership roles, helping them prepare, getting Israel ready. And whatever remnant they're in charge of, they're going to have a prominent uh, responsibility in the kingdom as well. So there's going to be great reward for leadership of Israel during the time of Jacob's trouble if they're doing the right thing, if they're leading appropriately. But the punishment will be severe, just as severe as what the Pharisees are going to go through, both in their physical sufferings as well as the weeping and gnashing of teeth is a depiction of eternal suffering. All right. In the next two parables, we're going to look at information that is for the people and it's not aimed at the leadership. There's no indication that the leadership is mentioned here. Now, the talents is a question. We'll get to that in two weeks because next week, no class. Okay. So, but in two weeks, we'll talk about the parable of the talents in which that's a question. What are the talents? And it's not, hey, I have an ability. It's probably more along the lines of talents of gold. So it's because you're invest talent. I don't know how to do that. So dealing with talents of gold, dealing with amount of monies. So it's not a matter of dealing with uh, physical responsibilities of people, but rather physical responsibilities of what you have been blessed with. All right. Moving on from that concept, we'll talk tonight about the parable of the 10 virgins. And this is where we're going to begin our new information. So Matthew 25, 1 through 4. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. We'll read together. We're going to make a lot of observations. We're going to answer some questions, hopefully, after doing all that we've done. 15 lessons into Matthew, uh, onto the Olivet Discourse. 108 lessons into the book of Matthew. The parable of the ten virgins should be easy. I'm not, if it's not, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be demean, really. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make you feel bad about yourselves. But by this time, we, this, this should flow very easily into understanding. You should automatically get these things because we've gone through all the context so we don't have to hopefully remind ourselves too much. Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oils and flasks along with their lamps. Now, when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Now, I'm not going to go over all the rules for parables. We did that at the beginning of chapter 24 where we dealt with the parable of the fig tree. However, hopefully you remember some of the rules that we've kind of covered them enough to, to that 
it's not going to be a difficult memory. What are some of the most basics? The first one, if, I, if, if you wanted to skip to the end, if you want to listen to this for 15 minutes and then go, okay, I'm done, here's your one opportunity. Jesus explains the parable. If Jesus explains the parable, what do we do with the information? That's where we, that's it. We're done. We just leave it there. We don't have to go any further than that. You can read the parable of the 10 verses and go, what does that mean? And you read verse 13 and go, oh, I know what that means now. That's all you have to do. But for the sake of content and so that we can answer some questions, let's go into some of the details. Now, again, the entire context of the parable must put into put in content of the, the kingdom. Why? Because that's the first thing that's mentioned. The kingdom of heaven will be compared to. Everything that follows must be compared to the kingdom of heaven. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people still think that the kingdom of heaven is about the church. I actually, you know, I, I, I think I have fun being a little bit of a protagonist to kind of question and debate online. I don't suggest it. All you do is frustrate yourself. But I got into a little Twitter conversation with somebody. Because they're like, you know, why? Because one guy actually mentioned the fact, and I was very happy with the fact that he said the church is not Israel. Israel is not the church. The kingdom of heaven is coming. It is not here. And I'm like, hey, fantastic. And somebody wrote something stupid. So I responded. So there are a lot of people out there that still look at the word kingdom of heaven and think that's us in the now. And there's a lot of problems with that. One of the issues is it eliminates the promises made to Israel. And now Christians are becoming, well, that Israel over there is not real Israel. And so therefore, they are not worthy of our defense, and God does not really care about them. Boy, and that's the issue, right? Okay, so that's one of the problems. So in dealing with this content, we understand that when we see kingdom of heaven, it's about the literal physical return of Jesus Christ to earth and establishing his kingdom on Israel, in Israel, restoring the kingdom. Restoring Israel specifically. So this is about Israel, not the church. If this is redundant to you, fantastic. I've done my job. If this is like not redundant, you need to hear this even better because we need to make sure we stay on topic. This is about Jesus returning to earth. It's not about the rapture. Second coming language. It's not about the rapture. The characteristics um, of the activity of Israel is on display prior to his return. That's what the parable of the ten virgins is about. It's about what is Israel doing, what are their characteristics prior to his return. That's what this is about. The name of the parable revolves around the main subjects, which is the virgins, right? But, you know, obviously the main person it's talking about is the groom. Now, I've never, I've never, bridegroom, is that a thing? I don't know. Did we ever use that language even recently? It's, biblical, it's in the Bible, of course, and that's the actual literal translation. I'll just call them the groom. But why virgins? We don't go around calling people virgins, right? It's just, you know, like as, as much as we like to say so, you know, like even we have small children, we don't go around, hey, you know, there's 30 virgins running around here now. We don't, we don't, <laughs> that'd be awkward, right? It's not what we say. However, the word, and, and I've considered different, different translations, the word is actually Parthenos. This word literally means virgin. Um, in fact, if you recognize the word Parthenos, well, how would you normally recognize this word Parthenos? Where do you, where do you recognize that word from? The, the Parthenon. And what is the Parthenon? Well, it's a name given to a building, but it's actually given to a building in, that is built for um, Athena, the virgin. That's her, that's her name. Athena Parthenon. Parthenos. That's, that's what they called her. Um, she was, a, respect, she was a, a false deity, an idol. In Greece, so then they built the Parthenon in, in kind of honorific of their own imagination. I don't say of her because she's not real. So if you're going to translate the word Parthenos, you have to you have to use the word virgin. 
Could you use the term young maiden or chaste maiden? Well, a chaste woman basically means they're not having sex now. It has nothing to do with the past. A virgin means never. So there's really no other word in English that kind of captures the concept of being uh, Parthenos other than virgin. So it is what it is. The word is used all throughout Scripture. So therefore, if we're going to go ahead and be consistent with our literal translations and always has been chaste, there's only one word really that fits that, and that is virgin. Why is this designation used? What's going on here? Well, these ten virgins go out to meet the groom. When, what kind of language? What's happening here? Well, groom, virgins. Now, don't think anything weird, all right? These ten virgins are not gifts, okay? They're not a harem. Stop that. That's not the implication of this text. It deals with the imagery and the traditions of this absolute chaos. Now, we like weddings. We enjoy weddings. I don't think our American wedding will ever capture the absolute festivity and what we would perceive as chaos of a Jewish wedding, especially that of the traditional one. Today, it's a little bit more modernized. A Jewish wedding, how, how, anybody idea how long a Jewish wedding can last? The wedding, seven days. <laughs> seven days. We go to a wedding, we're like, this thing better be over by 1045 because I, I got something to do, you know? You know, we, we, if, it's, if it's longer than an hour, the ceremony itself, we're like, we're fidgety, you know? And then, the, okay, let's get some nice food. If we're not satisfied with the food, we want to get out of there as soon as possible. Can you imagine going somewhere and, and, and having festivities for seven days. It's, that's insane to me. Um, I mean, sure, I'd like the time off of work, but... <laughs> now, so to be able to understand the full content of this, I do want to go over the content of a Jewish wedding. Um. And, you know, I found something from Thomas Constable. Um, if you don't know who he is, he's a really good resource, a lot, a really good researcher. Don't agree with all of his content and all his conclusions, but the, the history of, of, the, of it is really good. Um, first and foremost, the parents arranged the marriage between the, with the consent of the bride and groom. Number, number one, no way is getting married without consent. A guy could go, no, thank you, and the woman could go, no, thank you. You're just kind of getting them in the room to meet, and then they start negotiations. Outside of, our, outside of our culture, but it's how they did it. Uh, number two, the couple's past engagement period for many months, up to a year, okay, um, so that everything would be understood. And hopefully, uh, again, I love the language here, hopefully that that bride was a virgin. That was just basically the concept of the idea of, of the kind of the testing. I don't know how they tested that. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, on the day of the wedding, the groom would go back from his father's house to the bride's house. If that was across the street, if that was down the road, if that was across the, the countryside, they would take a trip to go back and basically retrieve the bride. The marriage ceremony would take place in the bride's home. That's the marriage ceremony. Okay. On the eve of the day of the wedding, the groom would take the bride home and everybody would follow. <clears throat> Again, I just, I, I find this kind of a, a lot to do. You know, we, we, we get, we, we don't have this big of a to do. But I don't know, maybe it'd be fun to go ahead and watch this and just, they go there and then they get married. And then they, at that night, then they, everyone walks back over towards the groom's home. Now, again, if that's across the countryside, that's a big trip. So on the evening of the day of the wedding, the groom would take his bride home. This involved a nighttime procession through the streets, greeted by maidens of the town at the house of the groom. So this whole wedding party thing, it's not really a concept, but the, the maidens, 
the virgins of the town, a select few of them, would be invited typically to kind of give a formal greeting. Now, other people had other responsibilities of formal greetings, but there was a special designation for the basically the, the virgins of the town, and especially in greeting the groom as they come back from the actual ceremony. Later that night, there would be a banquet, and often that would last for several nights. Now, I think that that's a, I put that in parentheses because that's not mentioned in the, in the actual parable, and I don't think it's something we should actually dwell upon. I just find that often strange. Again, this often took place in the groom's home or the father's home. And remember, they had typically an attachment to that father's home for the bride um, of the groom. Now, interestingly enough, is the bride mentioned in this parable? Isn't that strange? You know, if you're going to have this parable about a groom and a bride and the, and the actual procession, all kinds of stuff, you'd think the bride would be mentioned, not even mentioned. It's not what's important. A lot of times the stories are limited to that which the content of information is what is vital. So that is the Jewish wedding. Now, with that established, we hopefully we can get a better grasp of what's happening here and not try to like, you know, jump through hoops to try to figure out what's going on with these 10 virgins. Now, the number 10 seems to be used around to have a nice round number. So that two groups can easily be designated. It could have been 12. It could have been six. It doesn't matter. Jesus just used the word 10. I've looked just to make sure. I cannot find that there, if 10 was a traditional number. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything indicating anywhere about the number 10 associated with the virgins of this particular parable. I cannot find any significance to the number of maidens. So now that kind of brings us to verse 2, and the fact that Jesus now designates them as five is foolish and five is prudent. Now, I do want to go over this a little bit more intently because I find this to be very important in the overall context of the parable itself. The word foolish is the word moros, or moros, and it literally means stupid, foolish, or useless. Now, in context of the word group in itself, it seems to be a thinking or a function that is outside of its intent, of what, side of what you would say proper. This word unusually is used in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, which basically says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how made salty again? That word tasteless is the word moros. Um, the salt became stupid. I, well, if you have salt that is, that is not salty, you'd go, that's stupid salt. Right? Yeah. Why? Because it's outside of the intended use. It's pointless. It is useless. The word for um, for for this foolish virgins, they are functioning. They are going to be thinking and functioning outside of what is properly or what is intended for their what they're supposed to be doing. And we also understand that clearly because the word used in in contrast to this foolishness is the word prudent. Prudent is the word uh, phronimos. Phronimos is a word that comes from my favorite thinking word, frame. Frame is used primarily, uh, or not primarily, but used often in the book of Philippians. And it is the, the frame of Jesus Christ that we are supposed to think like Christ. This remember if you if you were there for Philippians or remember it, it's not just what you know; it's how you think that is going to be Christ-like. It's not just putting everything into reference or a point. It's not just the details. It is the way you consider information, the way that you evaluate, the way you look at people, the way you look at the world. This is the thinking of Christ, not simply the content of doctrine. In the overall idea of the prudent. Ten ver the prudent five virgins were dealing with individuals who are being wise, they have insight, they're sensible, or they understand the assignment and they perform it adequately. They're thinking about it, they're being intentional, and they, they take proper precautions. 
So in kind of conclusion of that idea here is that we the foolish think are thinking in a function in opposition to what is proper and the prudent are thoughts and activity that are in alignment with what is proper and good. Now in verse three, the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. In verse four, the prudent took oils in flasks along with their lamps. Now, a lot of people think that these uh, foolish virgins were so stupid. How stupid were they, Will? That they didn't even bring oil for their lamps to begin with. They just brought the lamps. Oh, uh, no, That's not true. In verse 8, we understand that the lamps already had oil in them. So in verse 8, our lamps are going out. So therefore, there was oil in the lamps, and but they didn't think properly. They didn't plan accordingly, and they didn't bring extra oil. That's the point here. They brought their, they brought their lamps, and it was probably enough for what was normal. In fact, I think they probably like said, "Okay, we'll bring enough oil here. We have it, we have it here ready." And he's going to come back around. Well, it gets dark now at five, you know. So when will you when would you start needing light? Five, but all of a sudden, you know, maybe two hours, seven. Then you you know you you went outside and you kind of greeted them. You walked them into the place with the lamps. That was the point. In their culture, that was an honorific given to the groom as he's coming home with his bride. That they were kind of escorted, giving them light as they entered, and then they would go inside with him. They're not inside the house with their lamps. They're outside the house, greeting him. But what happens? Well, that comes verses five through six. Now, while the brew, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. Do you see why we can't stretch this into every single aspect? Throughout the rest of the text, it all talks about being awake, being ready. Well, these ten virgins, even the five that were prudent, fell asleep. They're not awake, but they are. They're prepared. See, you got to be careful trying to stretch this all the way out. So in verses five through six, but at midnight, there was a shout, behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. They're coming out to meet him. Um, and again, where are they coming out of? Their own homes? The campment? I'm not sure. We, were, we, we assume a lot of information here, but they're not in the house with the father. They're actually going through the streets, and they're part of that procession, that final leg of that procession. So they got up to give a proper welcome and to guide him through the streets, back to the house. But what happens? Well, the virgins rose up. They trimmed their lamps, you know, because, you know, you got to sometimes the, the little uh, cloth will burn off a little bit too much, and they'll trim it down to make sure that it has a good flame and absorbs the, uh, the oil um, well. Well, they trim their oil, they trim their lamps, but there's no oil in the lamps. Uh oh, what do you do? <laughs> The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil. They brought oil, extra oil, reserve oil in flasks. They said, no. And again, well, couldn't they have split it? That's not the point. <laughs> okay. And the questions that you see that arrive off of this, you know, it's kind of, it, it, it does crack me up a lot of times. You know, they'd be like, oh, I can't believe that these, are, you know, the, the, the other five virgins didn't tell the groom to wait. That's it's not the point. <laughs> Right. Don't don't make this into something that's not. There's a point to be made from this. So the lamps are trimmed, but no oil in the lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you, too. And so instead, go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves at midnight. Not the point. <laughs> OK. Yes, at midnight. Can you go knock on the oil dealer's house at at midnight in ancient Jerusalem and get some oil? I, I don't know. Maybe they're maybe it's like New York. It's a, it's the city that never sleeps. Who knows? 
Again, I, I, you can't stretch this out too far. Otherwise, you just get lost in the details. In verse 10, though, while the foolish are out getting oil, what happens? The groom arrives. Isn't that always the way it happens? You go, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just close my eyes for a moment, and then all of a sudden you miss everything. Or you're going to go ahead and I need to run to the store real quick. You know, hopefully, you know, the Chiefs don't score. And as soon as you as soon as you turn your back to what spit, missed the score. Fortunately, we have DVRs now. We can rewatch it. So as soon as they go out to go get oil, that's when he arrives. They are they were demonstrated as unprepared. The rest, the ones that were prudent, were ready for him. And they went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Now we have verses 11 through 12 in which the foolish came back from the dealers requesting to be let in, but the door is shut and the groom will not let them in saying, I do not know you. Um, I would say probably on, probably in content that in the overall culture of the situation, why did the groom not let them in? What do you mean I don't know you? Now, people make a kind of a big idea. It's like, oh, I'm not intimate with you or, you know, I'm not I, I'm not sure who you are. Oh, it's dark outside. Well, dang it. None of that fits. What it appears as though is that they did not honor the groom. And so the groom's like, you weren't ready for me. Therefore, you don't get to enjoy my wedding feast with me. The parable, again, is often stretched into a place that is beyond recognition. I hope that, again, our, our the way we've treated the book, the way we've treated this passage overall, that this is very easy for you. But let's go ahead and ask this question. Why doesn't this fit? What, why is this not about the church? Why is this not about the saved? And, and ask the question again, do the, do the items actually represent anything? Because if you read most commentators, they, they get into wild speculations and imaginations over some of this content, all right? So first and foremost, um, they make a big deal about the virgins. Um, well, always keep it, we know we're keeping the context in the kingdom of heaven, so therefore it eliminates a lot of these questions already. But let's go ahead and put that aside for now and just ask the question, what about the virgins? Most of the time, they connect this passage, this parable, to 2 Corinthians 11.2. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you a pure virgin. And they go, see, it's about the church. And I go, there is, there is zero connection. There's, there's nothing here about the groom and the virgins. There's nothing here about welcoming into the wedding feast. There's nothing here about that. There, it is a similar vision, a similar imagery but it's not about the same content. We, we cannot pull from Paul and place it into here. There is no indication that this is what Jesus is talking about, dealing with the church itself. We know this. We've talked about that at length. So even though they do pull this, <clears throat> don't be afraid to look at that verse and go, yeah, Paul uses similar imagery in dealing with how he wants to present the church to Christ at the Bema. At their evaluation. Is there anything like that in dealing with the ten virgins? No. That's not what this is about. To make this parable about the church and a warning to foolish believers would have it indicate that some believers will not gain entrance into the kingdom. This is again where we talked about before dealing with outer darkness. Now, we will, in, in chapter 25, the parable of talents, we're going to go over that in depth again, because at the verse 30, it talks about the outer darkness. So this place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, they're shut out. All these concepts, people have taken that and tried to put that in context of the church and rewards in the kingdom. That is dangerous. Again, it's parabolic, but if you're going to read this for the point, five of the virgins 
don't get in. And he says, I don't know you. They were unprepared. They don't have any, they didn't have any oil. Another mistake is to make the oil in the lamp a reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit? Yeah. This is what I learned growing up. All the, all the churches I went to, when we did this parable, it was about the Holy Spirit. Some had the Holy Spirit, some don't. Is that what it says? No. First of all, they all had it. And then they all ran out. That's weird. If this is about the Holy Spirit and, defi and, and, and they all had it, but five ran out of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and I just you get kind of dwindled your supply of Holy Spirit. That doesn't make any sense, right? Plus, how do you go buy more Holy Spirit? I mean, even in, even in content of, of parables, what are you talking about? Go get yourself some more Holy Spirit. And now, now you're getting into weird theology. So, when you're dealing with parables, the most simple concepts are always used. And again, we know the conclusion, so I'm not going to get there just yet, but I'll, I'll get there in just a moment. But the most simple concepts are used. So therefore, the virgins, the lamps, and the oil does not and cannot refer to anything spiritual with any consistency. <clears throat> the virgins indicate the church or believers. It misses. The, the oil refers to the Holy Spirit. It misses. The lamp is a church. It misses. Just because they use the same imagery <clears throat> in one place or another, because remember, in Revelation, lamp is used in, as far as the church understanding, the lampstand in, in Revelation 2 through 4. It's not the same thing. Same imagery, different point. <clears throat> How do we know? The context. The context is about Israel. The context is about what? Well, we know the answer. Verse 13. Be on the alert. Okay? Be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. The point of the passage is to be ready, to be watchful, to be wise, because the hour of the groom's return is unknown. Why is it unknown? Because the day of the Lord is unknown. He's just borrowing the imagery, borrowing the language. So when we, if you ever get into conversations or you ever just reading through Matthew again, always remember this. We, we have to make sure that we grasp this. These parables are about Israel. It's about the kingdom of heaven. It's about their restoration. It's about them being ready. And we've already seen through our, through our, through our evaluation of eschatology on Sunday and through the, 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 this all of the discourse on Matthew 24 and 25, that this is about Israel being ready. And we know that there will be a significant portion called the many, which will not be ready. They will die and they will not be allowed to go into the kingdom. What does all this mean? Well, you know, let's not, let's not dive too far into it, but we can understand the groom is Jesus, right? Um, we don't add into the text any interpretation about the bride because the bride's not mentioned. Oh, Jesus is coming back with the bride. That's the church. Stop it. Okay? That's not here. That's not in the text. And second of all, you know how I feel about that. I don't believe the church is the bride of Christ. I think that's a very big misnomer. The ten virgins represent the people of Israel, I think, in total. The event is the literal return of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom. The foolish are those Israelites who are unprepared, unwatchful, and foolish. They, they are not ready for the return of Jesus. And the prudent are Israelites who are ready at his coming. If you want to go ahead and give it the Daniel treatment, then I would say that the, uh, the foolish ones are the many, the people of Israel who are not believers, the prudent are the ones who have insight, which we refer to as the remnant. 
any attempt to draw a connection between the, the parable and the character or understanding the foolish. Like, for example, like one person says, well, the foolish, that's kind of strange because they seem to be looking for it, but then they're just a little bit unprepared. Again, not the point. Don't try to figure out all the different implications based upon us reading between the lines in the parable. We already know how the many will act and what they will think. He has just reflected them as the unprepared ones. The parable simply highlights that Israel is responsible for being ready at any moment. Jesus knows that Israel will be set aside as the administration for the administration of the church. He knows the church's eschatology. Yet he still gives Israel this imminent responsibility to say, we don't know when that day of the Lord will happen. He doesn't give them that information, but they're still responsible for always being ready. Now, what can we learn from this? Now, obviously, the same language is used by Paul in the fact that we also are always to be ready because we don't know when we're getting raptured. It, is it parallel to one another in thought? Absolutely, but it's not the same lesson. There is nothing within our eschatology that ever warns that we might miss it. There is nothing in our eschatology that says that we're going to be shut out of the kingdom. That we're going to partial rapture. That is, some people say, that they remember we talked about this in our rapture uh, conference, that they believe in a partial rapture. I think I did that with that on Friday night, where if you're ready, you get to go. If you're not ready, you have to stay. Ridiculous. Nothing in the text supports that. It's only in the imagination of people who don't understand the church's eschatology. So the consequences of not being ready, what are they? Well, I do believe that there is a lack of what could have been in coming dealing with rewards. There is a, um, a potential concept of what we would be thinking, our perception. But I want to go over this with you since we have a few minutes left, and I can go we'll take a quick walk through it. If you will, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We'll give it a read. We'll make some observations. Real quick, I got 10 minutes. I feel like a lot of times when we're dealing with the book of Matthew, it feels like, ah, that's nice, Will. That's all for them. But the typical desire is, what about us? Well, okay, you know what? I felt like I, I, the content, I felt like I, I, I would be able to go over this information, and I'm glad I do. Because I want to be able to give it to you at least once in the context of, this, of, the, of the Olivet Discourse. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written for you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Day of the Lord reference to the terrible troubles that they're going to have, not the rapture. While they are all saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman or child, and they will not they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. With the result that the day would overtake you like a thief. Because the only way you get there is if you're in darkness. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, okay, here's the point that Paul's making. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. The contrast of sleeping and alert and sober means be ready and let us not, not be ready. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night. For those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are the day, let us be sober. In other words, the, the, the reason why we should be sober and awake and alert and ready for the rapture to happen for us at any moment. Why? Because that's who we are. The, one of the major distinctions when it comes down to living by grace 
is to not do things as for a benefit, but because we're already benefited. We are of day. We're not of night. Therefore, we should be ready. It's like telling, you know, a 13-year-old to stop acting like a child. 13, but you should be acting a certain way by now, not because you're going to get rewarded or punished, but rather because that's who you are. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's our hope. For God has not destined us for wrath. Amen. But for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Now pay attention with what's next. So then, whether we are awake or asleep. Now, sometimes asleep can be used in reference to believer's death. But in context, this is not here. This is dealing with don't sleep like others do. Don't be unprepared. So whether or not we are prepared or unprepared, we will live together with him. Now, again, does that, what, what is typically understood when we tell people that type of information? When we say to people, hey, whether or not we are prepared, we're all going to live with him. We're all going to be taken up. We will be saved from that wrath, whether or not we're prepared to see him. Well, you're just giving what? License. You see, they, they're still thinking law mentality. We need to think grace mentality. In Matthew, is it grace mentality or law mentality? It's law mentality. It is not grace mentality. He doesn't tell the virgins, hey, you all are all going to enter into the kingdom. You are all going to enter in. Doesn't matter what you do, but since you are, light your lamps. He's telling them, no. If you don't light your lamps, if you are asleep and not awake, prepared, unprepared at that time, you don't get in. You see the difference. The language is very similar when it comes down to how we are to function. We are had the same outlook. We had the same hope of salvation. However, whether or not we are ready or not ready, we will live together with him. And this is the best part about it. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Now, it's not going by fast. Maybe I was trying to speak a little too quickly to keep somebody awake. Ah. <laughs> so I will, as Sarah suggested, I have a few minutes. I'll go ahead and I'll look at the chat here. Does anybody have any questions about this content? I know that this sometimes this can kind of drive a few people mad. I'll give it a few. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. so all the believers should already be caught up at this point. Right. But he says, uh, well, people who think peace and safety and destruction will come to them, uh, so that suddenly the labor pains and they will not escape. And then in verse 4 it says, but you brothers mm -hmm. are not in darkness, so this day should not surprise you like a thief. Yes, yeah, so the, word the word surprise is a bad bad understanding. That's, that's a bad translation. Um, overtaken the NASB is a much better translation, basically that you're going to be taken over by this particular situation. It's not about it being surprised by it. But it shouldn't take them over because they shouldn't be there. Right. And that, that's the point is because it's right. not that they won't be overcome by it because you're not of darkness. You're not of day. You're, you're of day. So because they're not of darkness or day, they're going to be gone by then. That's why it's not going to happen. That's why it's not going to overtake them like like a thief because they're already going to be out of there. And uh, that's reemphasized as well in Second Thessalonians chapter chapter two, so that you know then we deal with that word apostasy, which is actually the word um, departure, ha apostasia, so that we know that we're not in part of the day of the Lord because we're all, because we're already gone. I don't see any questions online. Yes, sir. Can we then say, and I may have missed this on the speaker, but that 1 Thessalonians 5 is uh, hope and 
grace, whereas uh, Matthew 25 and the other verses is a warning. Yeah, I would definitely say it's a warning. Or, yeah, you're absolutely right. So the question was, and I'll just go ahead and repeat it as a statement. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're dealing with a hope of salvation for those who are believers, who are of who are sons who are of day, and that is a comforting thing. Therefore, comfort one another and encourage one another. Okay, so that's the overall point. Where in Matthew, if you're not ready, you're getting shut out. That's an absolute warning passage to Israel during the time of Jacob's trouble right before his return. So we're encouraged. They're warned. Um, and I, and again, when it comes down to our eschatology, I don't find warning. I find the fact that we are under that grace. And so therefore, we should be acting in a very prudent and watchful manner because of our promises, because of who we are. However, to them, if they don't act right, if they don't act in accordance with the truth, if they're not prepared for his arrival, then they will not get in. And in fact, the 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 overall uh, information from Revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Matthew, is that they're going to get dead before his arrival because all of Israel will be, will be saved. So it's not like he's going to, to, to kind of like section out Jews that did, weren't ready for him. They're all, the, the point is you're not going to make it because you're going to be on the wrong side. They're going to be on the side of the many, and the many is going to be on the side of the beast. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll have a, and we'll, again, no class next week. I'll see you on Sunday. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word, for all that you have and given to us, and we pray that we we always uh, read your word with fervor, with intentional um, a desire to understand you better, to give you glory and praise. We thank you for everyone here and for those who are of us but not with us. We thank you for them, and we always pray we show you to their grace and mercy as you have shown us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.